I will, uh, I'll just start the shared screen. So I'm hoping now you're seeing a great big picture of a crested tit with Highland wildlife written beside it. Is that right? Yeah. Yep, yeah, jolly good. <clears throat> so yes, she's absolutely right. I've been working for Speyside Wildlife now for, um, gosh, nearly 20 years, I think. So uh, a long time. And um, yeah, so I know the Highlands very well. Uh, and to be honest, when I first started traveling up there, a large part of the reason I was going, uh, part of it was bird watching, obviously, but uh, also for the scenery. I mean, I'm just going to flick through a few slides just to give you a feeling for the beauty of the place, because I think I, I still feel, despite having traveled all over the world to loads of different places, I still feel a real um, love for the Highlands of Scotland because the scenery is just so beautiful. So you've got that wonderful backdrop in which to see this amazing, spectacular group of birds and mammals and dragonflies and flowers and all sorts of things. Um, so for me, I think it's still probably the most exciting part of the UK in terms of the, the quality of the wildlife there. And I just made that little montage up just to give you a feeling for sort of some of the, the special birds and mammals and other things that you can see. So the plan this evening is to, to kind of go through all that stuff. Um, by the Highlands, um, I remember the first time I went to Scotland, I came over the Scottish border and thought, whoa, I'm nearly there. And I was on my way to Inverness and it still took several hours to get to Inverness. I didn't realize how huge Scotland is actually, it's a big country. And initially when you first cross the border, it doesn't really seem that different. Um, you go through the Southern Uplands, which is a bit hilly and then that lowland area and it's only when you reach where that blue line is which is around about Perth or so a little bit north of Perth that you start really getting into the highlands so sort of everything north and west of that line I think of as the highlands and I traveled hugely up there for years and years trying to see all the different birds and mammals and butterflies and all sorts of things onto the islands I went right up into the northwest as far as you can go and all sorts of places um, and then I got a job with Space Hard Wildlife leading holidays and the first two or three years of that really the vast bulk of my work there leading the trips was um what's going on there was um traveling around in Scotland showing people the wildlife there and I very quickly realized that although I traveled very very widely and covered huge areas uh, you could actually show people the vast majority of the species that I'd seen in three areas. Uh, so what I'm going to do tonight is I'm, I'm instead of talking about the entire Highlands of Scotland, I'm going to particularly make it these three uh, regions where um, I, I kind of we can pretty much see most of the species that you might be interested in seeing. Um, the first of those is Speyside and you know we are it's something very weird going on it's making lines on my drawings here I don't know what's going on there um how odd uh, anyway so uh, the probably two-thirds of the talk or more is going to be about uh Speyside um and then I'll move up to the Moray Firth and that sort of region up there and then over to the northwest coast and when I'm talking about Speyside, in case you're not sure what I mean, it's, it's the River Spey is that dark blue line that sort of wiggles its way down to the coast. <clears throat> so Speyside is really anything that's beside the River Spey, uh, anything within that valley. But, but for most bird watchers, you tend to visit that area that I've made in, in a in large box there from Newton Moor right up to Grand Town, that whole area there with Abernethy Forest and uh, Loch Garten, to some extent the Cairngorms Mountains, you've got Inch Marshes in there. And I'm also going to sneak in, although technically it isn't really Speyside, um, the Findhorn Valley, which is very, very famous and so close by, it would be a bit crazy to ignore it. So why Speyside? Why am I spending a huge amount of the talk and, and the time while we're up there? And why the company's based there? Why is Speyside so special? And that bird is one of the reasons, really. And you actually find, if you look at the birds that occur in that area as well as being species you'll see over a lot of the highlands it's got a few very very special birds that you wouldn't see anywhere else so that's four of them um the main four really you've got crested tit uh slavonian grebe technically you can see elsewhere but in in 
reasonable numbers, but I'll explain why I've included it in a minute. Um, Scottish Crossbill and Capercaillie. And I'll tell you now, that map for Capercaillie is uh, showing Capercaillie in places they don't exist anymore. They've really declined, so we'll talk about those. Um, so the first one of those four is Crested Tit. And obviously anybody coming up to Speyside will be keen to see this. It's just a delightful little bird. And it occurs in the uh, in the forest all around Abernethy and even right up to the coast in plantations and stuff. Um, and it's a real puzzle. I think it's an absolutely gorgeous little bird. But why it is quite so restricted within the UK, I really don't know. Um, I'm very, very puzzled by it. If, if you actually... Well, the first time I saw one, I suppose I was in Abernethy Forest area and you, you're in this beautiful ancient forest with big old granny pines and stuff and you think, well, it must presumably be that this species needs this habitat. Um, then you go over to D side, you've only got to cross over the mountains and drop into the next big valley uh, around Bray Mar and that area and you're into yet more of this exactly identical habitat. It, it, you, I, if you dropped me blindfolded from a helicopter into that area. I couldn't tell you that I wasn't in space side. There's huge areas of forest there that looks identical and yet there's no crested tits. It's really strange. So it kind of puzzles me a bit and then the first time I went to Spain and I was in Holm Oaks and stuff there and heard crested tit calling and thought what? <laughs> Finally found this crested tit there. I'm thinking well that's really weird you know they clearly don't need this specific habitat. So quite what historical um, happened to to result in them only being in Speyside I don't know and it seems to me like for them to get out of Speyside they've got reasonable sized barriers to cross either mountain ranges or open land or whatever so it's perhaps not too surprising they haven't spread anywhere else because they're not a bird that really travels much at all but it, it's still <laughs> in many ways very very puzzling for me um, um so i mentioned slavonian grebe earlier um let me just admit this person um slavonian grebe um you, I don't know whether you noticed on the map I showed earlier, but it had this big area around Speyside, but it also actually showed Slavonian grebes all around the coast. And so you might think, well, that's not particularly special to Speyside then. But to be honest, if you see one around the coast, it's almost certainly going to look like that bird there. That's a typical Slavonian grebe in winter plumage. And that's when you say you see them around the British coast, that's when you generally see them. So you might get a few in breeding plumage just before they disappear, but 90 something percent of your Slavonian greaves are going to look like that. Whereas in Speyside, um, they look like that, which is considerably different, isn't it? That is an absolutely stunning little bird. And they've got, they've had very mixed fortunes. They, um, they've never been common. Um, they've always been just in that, re that fairly localised area. And there are certainly some in the Abernethy area and on small lochs there. The biggest population is actually just outside of Speyside, um, near Inverness and sort of up into um, the valleys up there near Loch Ness, where you've got um, the RSPB reserve at Loch Ruthven. And there'll probably be about half of the UK's population nesting on that one loch. Uh, numbers used to be up at about 80 or so pairs. And that was considered very successful because there'd only been about 20 or so and they rose up to 80 and then they dropped right down again and then they came back up again and then they dropped down again. So it's really strange. The population seems to be all over the place. And at the moment, it's at a low again. It's only 20 something pairs at the moment or around about 30. And um, th there's lots of studies going on trying to work out what the problem is, but they can't really work it out. It's, it's really strange. There's a lot of the locks where they've stopped breathing or they're no longer successful don't seem to have changed in any way if you study the small fish that are in there and stuff there seems to be plenty of food so big puzzle rspb are working on it we'll see where it ends up but um at the moment it's uh very very puzzling however they're still there at the moment and if you're up in that way in the summer really worth looking out for the third of those species that um i mentioned earlier with those maps is capicaley and capicaley have had a very uh kind of checkered history really they many many years ago did were doing quite well in the UK especially when there was a more forest 
uh, and then they were completely wiped out. That was hunting, basically. They were they were hunted out. They, they were considered quite a prize to shoot, so a lot of people shot them, and eventually they were completely wiped out in the 1800s. Uh, they were then reintroduced, um, and the numbers did quite well. They, they came back rather well. They, when I was living up in Speyside, I don't actually live up there anymore. Uh, I haven't lived there since the 1980s. And in the 1980s, there were loads. It was, wasn't difficult to find a capercaillie. And even if you moved down into Perthshire and other areas down there, you could see capercaillie without too much difficulty if you knew where to go. Uh, and then this huge decline happened. And um, there was a lot of research done into that. And at one point, they thought it might be um, the offences. They were flying into those. Some people have speculated that the um, uh, pine martins have come back in huge numbers compared to what they were years ago and they wonder whether pine martins were eating their eggs. Um, I personally think that the other th there's a, th a theory to do with the weather as well and basically in a lot of recent years the weather patterns have changed and we're now getting an awful lot more very cold weather and wet weather in late May early June which is just when the chicks are hatching. So my suspicion is that Actually, it's probably the weather that's doing for them. Um, and the numbers, as you can see there, have absolutely crashed. So even in recent years, when we're working really hard at, at protection, improving habitat and all sorts of things, the numbers are still declining to only just over a thousand pairs. Uh, birds, sorry, it's not even pairs, it's birds. So it's it's really, uh, could we could lose Capricale. It's a very, very difficult bird to find now. And I... I well, I won't say I hate it, that's too strong a word, but I'm always slightly, but very often when you're leading a week up where one of the first things you ask people is, oh, what is it you're particularly keen to see? And when people go, oh, Capricalia, I think, oh, no. <laughs> um, slightly disappointed. Is that because you know you're going to really struggle to show them? Um, this is the habitat we're talking about in Abernethy Forest. It's a big area of this kind of ancient trees with sort of mixed young stuff and old stuff. And some of these trees were... There was a lot of this area was actually felled years ago and have come back and some of these big trees with the, lots of branches on that they call them the granny pines are the ones that reseeded the whole area but if you look at that it's got quite deep heather and um we had people come over from norway uh, where capricalis are still doing fine and said oh that's not really great for capricali because the chicks find that really tough and actually in some ways something like that which is is a plantation but it's got much shorter undergrowth with uh, mainly with a lot of bilberry and crowberry and things like that and cowberries um, that's actually according to the Norwegians a better habitat so the aim is to try and get a denser stand of pines in Abernethy Forest now and, and other areas nearby to try and get the ground floor of less heather and less deep um, now, years ago, this was how we used to try and see it a couple of years ago, three years ago or so, when we, they used to open up a hide at Abernethy to, actually, this is the osprey hide, and they would open that at five in the morning because there used to be a lecking bird or two out in front of the hide. But they've stopped that now, unfortunately, because um, the, the lek moved. It's the problem with Capricale leks is they're not static in the way that black grouse leks are. Uh, that looks horrendous, that picture, <laughs> all these people trying to see out the pictures. Could get a bit like that sometimes if there wasn't a bird showing and people were still turning up. But there's, I feel kind of like there's hope on the horizon because um, this scheme started up. This is uh, a thing called Cairngorm, Cairngorms Connect and it involves the RSPB and forestry and various other local landowners who've, um, I'm not quite sure how to describe it, they basically clubbed grouped together to create this enormous area this is their aim is to then um, improve the habitat in this huge area of joined um, land managements to make it better for all sorts of wildlife but in particular for Capricale so that little collection of pictures there is kind of showing to some extent what they're what they're doing so they're the bottom right is a red deer obviously and what they're basically saying is that if we're going to try and improve this habitat and get the forest um, with a, uh, a shorter understory because it's got more cover uh, you haven't got as much light getting through so you want to denser, denser stands of trees and more trees um, and also trying to extend the size of the forest into new areas because a lot of the area just outside Abernethy at the moment is all um, bog, bog land really and, and, and moorland 
um, they're going to try and extend the forest up onto the mountains, onto the Cairngorms. So part of the part of the method is actually to reduce the number of red deer so that you'll get a lot more regeneration. And that picture bottom left is showing the natural regeneration of pines in forestry where they've um, removed some of the deer. And then, as I said, the aim is to then actually let that happen um, naturally right up to the tree line. And if you look at that top right picture, that's showing some of the montane willows and things which you uh, naturally get in some areas for, um, so, oh, I'm trying to think where. So if you go to somewhere like Norway or whatever, as you get much higher up the mountains, you get into this montane willow and stuff. And that's a totally different habitat. We've got very little of that in the UK. There's some bits of it in Perthshire and Tayside, but uh, not very much. And it'd be great if we could reinstate a certain amount of that. That's the area of land we're talking about, it's huge. I mean, you've got King Usi sort of on the left-hand side of it there where it meets the main road, but it comes way south of King Usi and way up far north, further north and Abbey Moor and right up into the Cairngorm Mountains themselves to the summits. So it's an enormous area. And um, if it works, I think it could it could certainly benefit the Capicales and hopefully we'll see more of them. Um, it's a long-term scheme we're talking about. They're, they're projecting... Um, aiming to get to a certain point within 200 years so it's not even all going to happen within the lifetime of the people involved so it's hoping that it will be continued for generations uh, and you never know if you can get this montane willow going on further up into the mountains you could even start getting birds like this nesting up there this, this is these were both photos I took in Norway um, where you're right up in you know similar sort of habitat to what we're hoping to create up on the Cairngorms. So possibly exciting stuff and possibly helping the Capicales out in the future. Um, so moving on to the fourth bird from those maps I showed you earlier. Um, the fourth one was Scottish crossbill but it's a little bit more complicated than that and this bird I don't think is a Scottish crossbill, that's a common crossbill I think. Um, and this is the problem. You, you find a crossbills up there and you'll get people who say, oh, I really want to see Scottish crossbill while I'm in the area. And um, years ago, when I was living up there in the 1980s, we basically used to think any crossbill we saw up there was a Scottish crossbill. And they're supposed to be um, a species which stays uh, just within that area. They only occur in Speyside. They never leave Speyside, is what we're told. And there are subtle differences in... Uh, telling Scottish crossbill from common crossbill. Then in 1995, I think it was, I might have made that date up, but I don't think so. <laughs> um, we had a huge influx of crossbills at winter from the continent, absolutely massive. And in amongst those birds, it was mainly common crossbills, but also parrot crossbills as well. And all three species were in Speyside in reasonable numbers, and some of them stayed. So now if you're in Speyside, you can potentially see all three of these species together in in one little bit of woodland so it it's now a lot more challenging to know what you're looking at so for your <laughs> the top right bird there with a rather slim bill with quite a big overlap is common crossbill the one to the left of it so top left is scottish crossbill and i always think on the scottish crossbill the bill the it, well according to the books and everything it's supposed to be a deeper bill and uh, it's a more muscly bird too so it, it has that sort of rather more almost circular bill instead of it being elongated and then parrot crossbill at the bottom there is a really large bill indeed now the problem is it's not quite as simple as that if they all looked exactly like those pictures you could maybe feel a little confidence in doing it but parrot crossbills don't always have such a huge bill and Scottish crossbills, you know, their bill shape varies too. And some common crossbills have quite a largish bill. So there's actually overlap with all, all three of these. So common and Scottish overlap a little bit in size of the bill. And so do Scottish and parrot. Um, now, the, one of the reasons it's import, important, is that right? I don't know how important it is, but, but Scottish crossbill at the moment is our only endemic but uh, not just our only endemic bird but our only endemic vertebrate um so within the uk it's the only one we've got so it kind of feels fairly important that we we know what we're looking at um 
And there's been huge controversy about whether or not Scottish crossbills should be considered a species or a subspecies of common or a subspecies of parrot or what exactly it should be. And so the RSPB did some research uh, back in 2006 and they looked at uh, the measurements of the bill to confirm exactly what they were looking at. And then they checked whether or not what were apparently Scottish crossbills were breeding with other Scottish crossbills, or whether there was any interbreeding going on. Um, and the other thing you can tell apparently from recording the calls and looking at sonograms is which one you've got as well. And they came to the conclusion that these different, these three different species really were staying separate. So they consider that this is a true species. Um, people are still disputing it, obviously. Uh, the interesting stuff here is, though, that if you, it's an extract from the Scottish Birds Rarities Committee website. And effectively what they've said is, if you find a bird that you're claiming is a Scottish crossbill and you're in, say, Dumfries and Galloway or wherever else, somewhere else within um, Scotland or even England or whatever, if you're going to put in a claim that you found a Scottish crossbill outside of Speyside area, you're going to have to actually have a recording of it from which you can get a sonogram. And it's not just any recording, you have to have what they call the excitement call, which is the one when they're just about to take flight. So they're up in a tree, um, they're sort of getting a bit excited before they fly, and that's the call that you need to record. And they won't even consider your record without a sonogram. They're that difficult to tell apart. So here you go, here's a bit of fun. <laughs> if you want to have a little look at those and see what you think they might be. Um, I think <laughs> that top left is very clearly a common crossbill. Um, the one in the middle, the bill looks a little thicker, but I would still, if I saw that somewhere, I would probably call that common. Uh, top right, I think that bill looks a little bit sturdier, so I'd probably think that was Scottish. And if you drop straight down, the one at the bottom right, I would say, is definitely parrot. That's a really big bill, and it has that bulkier head somehow. They somehow look really muscular cheeked. And the lower mandible, often on parrot, crossbill has that sort of angle it kind of comes out parallel with the top and then it curves up steeply steeply further out so i think those are fine so what do you think about the one bottom left kind of looks a little bit in between the parrot crossbill and the common doesn't it so do you think that could be scottish interestingly that photograph was taken in norfolk so it was being called a parrot crossbill at the time but i i still wonder sometimes um the very first year I ever did any guiding for Speyside Wildlife, uh, I spent 12 weeks in Speyside doing guiding there. I didn't go anywhere else. We spent the entire 12 weeks in Speyside. I did not see or hear a single crossbill of any sort. So to tell me that Scottish crossbills don't ever leave the area, I, I'm afraid I'm rather sceptical. So I don't know. Uh, I, I suspect they do move around and I suspect um, maybe you do need to get a recording to get it accepted, but it, it does make it quite a challenge. And um, even within Speyside now, the fact that all three speeches occur means it can be really difficult making a judgment. I often think I can tell, I can certainly pick out parrot crossbills on call. They make quite a deep noise. Common crossbills excitement call is much more chippy, so they tend to sound much higher pitched. Um, the frustration for me is sometimes I'll hear a bird and think, ah, it's probably Scottish. It sounds a little bit juppy instead of, so instead of chip, 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 which is common, they're supposed to be chup, 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 which is Scottish, and then chup, 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 which is, which is parrot. And you think, oh, crikey, really. But I've, I've before now I've had birds calling in a treetop. I thought, oh, that sounds like, I'm sure these are going to be Scottish. And then suddenly they start chipping really high pitch before they fly. And you think, oh, goodness me, I can't do it. So there's your biggest challenge. Go and sort that out for me. <laughs> Let's move on to things I can identify for sure, and that's this. Even the fish I can identify there. That's a pike in the claws of osprey. And what a bird. And I have to say, when I was up in um, Speyside in the 1980s, um, oh, it was always a thrilling day if you found an osprey, even then, because even though you were in exactly the right area, they weren't really that common. And if you look at uh, what actually happened, they were wiped out. Um, so completely extinct for quite some time and then in 1954 this was a completely natural comeback the first birds that bred at Loch Garden just returned there on their migrations saw Loch Garden and thought well this will do and stayed to breed and there was a humongous protection effort made to look after those birds and so um that pair was successful and, and they they 
there was a lot more egg collectors around then, so there was a huge effort with 24-hour-a-day watches. I was astonished when I looked up how slowly the uh, comeback was. I mean, you look at 1976, it was still only 14 pairs. I mean, that's 22 years later. But then things picked up, and, and now there's there's over 300 pairs in Scotland now, and they're doing really well. And when you're in Speyside, you see them all the time. They're all over the place, and it's just wonderful to have this great success story that you can thoroughly enjoy. You know, I mean, you, there's there's locks I've visited before now in the Speyside area where I've seen up to five ospreys fishing at a time. So no, it's, it's just brilliant. Other birds of the area, and you can see these in various places in the Highlands and even in Northern England. But, um, you know, black grouse are probably more common around there than anywhere else I know. They're doing very well. Red grouse, well, I mean, anywhere there's grouse more than you'll find red grouse, obviously, but they're doing very well there too. Uh, and black grouse, I just, I just love it. If you if you get a chance and you haven't seen it, to actually see a black grouse lek where all the males are doing this displaying and facing up to each other and having a go and all this stuff and putting on a show it's it's an awful lot of dance and, and bravado uh, all to impress the females and i'm told it's all down to position you know the females are not necessarily judging the dancing or the who's who looks the toughest they're they're kind of interesting who's got the, the spot uh, the best spot in the lek itself so it's an interesting uh, it's hard to know exactly what's going on when you're watching it but it, it's just brilliant. And the sound of the bubbling they make and all the rest of it is just wonderful. Um, you certainly get golden eagles in the area too. But they're doing quite well now. Um, there's a couple of pairs in Abernethy and I suspect more popping up nearby too. Certainly in Glenfeshy where, where we're based and so on. Um, so there's actually an eagle's nest not far from that view there. Uh, but what that shows is this view looking out from sort of the edge of Abernethy where you can see these granny pines that these will hopefully seed all this area and produce uh, forest going right up into the mountains there. But you can just walk right up and of course as you get higher up and more into the mountains uh, and you get more into this sort of habitat there's a few very special birds to look out for up there as well. So this is uh, absolutely classic sort of place to look for a, a couple of things. This is this habitat here with lots of bare rock and stuff is perfect for ptarmigan. <clears throat> As I'm sure you know, ptarmigan are, they're probably the only bird that never stops molting. They're white in the winter, um, much darker in the summer. They go over the same colour as the rocks very often in the summer and can be really hard to spot in the summer actually because they are very camouflaged and they will, they will just um, tuck themselves in the rocks and hide. Um, I was going to say, to some extent, one of the easiest times to spot them is in early spring, well, late spring, when the snow starts to melt now, um, the, time, the timing of the molt isn't to do with how much snow is around. It's much more to do with daylight hours and all the rest of it. So in the past, these have molted. So they've been pure white in the winter when the snow, in the spring when the snow melts, they, they're molting very actively at that point and they'll, they'll change too. But at the moment, the snow's melting before the timing and change in quite a few recent years. And it, it concerns me a little bit because that makes them stick out like a sore thumb. They're so easy to spot when they're like that. So you look at that bird on the right there against the heather. You imagine you're an eagle looking for a, something to eat and you know that ptarmigan <laughs> you know you're gonna spot them a mile away aren't you so it, it, it must be making it more challenging for them i think the other bird that is the classic one for up on top of the cairngorm plateau uh, because these don't like the high peaks they like sort of big rolling flattish areas uh to this this is doctoral and um they're doing reasonably well up on the cairngorm mountains indeed and the the, the I don't know whether or not climate change will hugely affect doctoral, but it, it may do. I don't know. Certainly at the moment, they're doing all right. And this is actually a female doctoral. They're one of these interesting species where the male and the female have done a bit of a role reversal. So the female is the one that is more colourful. She attracts the mate, but the she'll then mate with the male of who, who she finds there and she'll uh, lay her eggs in a nest that he's created and then he will sit on the eggs and raise the chicks and there's actually evidence from ringing and, and what have you that some of these females then will actually move on to find another mate to nest with 
uh, and some of those will be in Norway. So you might get a doctoral that flies all the way up from uh, North Africa, uh, flies up to, to Speyside Air up onto the Cairngorms, finds a male there, lays some eggs with him, then heads up to Norway, finds another male and has a second brood up there. It's a very clever way of getting two broods off this species where, um, if you think about it, the season when you're right up on the top of the mountains is so short. If their first brood fails, well, there just isn't time to raise a second brood. So um, what happens is this way they manage to get two broods of young. That's a male, as you can see, is much drabber underneath and much much blander looking. The face pattern is still smart, but but it's just not as colourful underneath. Uh, a few pairs of snow buntings. They actually spend the winter up there, even mainly around the car park, because they're very. Con they're, they seem to be well aware that people visiting that area will drop crumbs and leave bits of sandwich for them. But in the summer, there's a few pairs actually nest right up on the tops there, and uh, really, really beautiful to see them there. Great little bird. And we might talk about a few mammals. This is um, this is mountain hare. I'll come on to this more in a minute because there's actually a much, much easier places you can see mountain hare than on the Cairngorms. But uh, they're having a similar problem to ptarmigan in a way, looking white in that heathery background. But the whole area is good for mammals as well as birds. This is roe deer. There are absolutely loads of roe deer in the area. Um, still got a fantastic population of red squirrels too. Um, there's slight concerns that red squirrels could come in from the east because they're in Aberdeenshire now and there's a big fight going on against the red squirrels there trying to stop them from moving any further west but uh, certainly to come up from the south grey squirrels would have quite a barrier of mountains to cross so at the moment the red squirrels are still doing fine and there's no greys um, they're absolutely delightful uh, and I love seeing them um, and the population around there there's one or two other populations that do the same but there's all the ones in Speyside uh, they start the year with dark tails and young animals have dark tails but as the summer progresses the tail just gets whiter and whiter and whiter until it's almost sort of a pale creamy white all over and they look really different and, and they'll really catch the eye you'll be walking through one of these dense bits of forest or something and suddenly see this white thing bouncing through the heather and think, what's that and it's the tail of a red squirrel <laughs> Um, those who know the company and have been with us up to Speyside will recognise this as a hide that we had where we do mammal watching and um, I need to update my talk because this actually burnt down just over a year or so ago. Um, it was great that we had, uh, it was a great place we put food out and would take people in the evening to see badgers, badgers were really tame there. Um, and also pine martins, uh, absolutely fantastic animals. Just, uh, I adore pine martins. They are just delightful creatures to watch. Um, so we decided because of uh, partly the discussions with the landowners who, who weren't being very obliging anymore, um, not to rebuild in the same site, but we've now got a new hide uh, which I need to get pictures from um, to put into the talk instead. So we're kind of up and running now with a new hide and the badgers are coming in there really, really well. Uh, there was a local badger set at this new site and the badgers just took to being fed very quickly. Pine martins not quite as reliable as they used to be at the moment, but they're becoming more reliable. Um, so I predict in the future we'll get, we'll get plenty of pine martins too. And they're just brilliant. Look at that. All of them have different, slightly different markings on the chest, so you can actually identify different individuals. These are two of the kits from one year. And quite often the females, as they get further into the summer, will actually bring the kits with them. And sometimes you might get four or five pine martins at the same time. And of course, other creatures are brought in by the, the food too. This is a little wood mouse. You get lovely views of wood mice scurrying in and out to pick up the peanuts as well. We've had tawny owls coming in to take the wood mice. So you never know, you can never know your luck. Um, I'm personally into all sorts of wildlife. Uh, so I'm not just into the birds. I started as a bird watcher, got more into mammals as well. And then over time I've got into butterflies, dragonflies, flowers and all sorts. So there's a certain collection of other things. So the next few slides are pictures of other stuff really. So this is twin flower. Uh, you can see why it's called that. It forms these huge sheets, which are just beautiful. It's a very rare plant in, in the UK. 
and almost all of the sites for it are within Speyside. So if it's a plant you're keen to see, uh, we do do one week in the summer, that, which coincides with when Twin Flower is in flower. We call it the Wildlife Bonanza Week because we're looking at all sorts of wildlife on that week. Um, I just love it. It's one of the, my favourite plants in the UK. It occurs all over the, uh, anywhere in the far north, to be honest. It's all through Scandinavia and northern Russia, even in Canada. But in the UK, it's really quite restricted. Uh, as are a lot of these as well. There's a, there's a bunch of wintergreens, as they're called, which are quite rare in the UK, also very far north. So on that particular week we run, we really focus on seeing a lot of the flowers as well. Uh, these are different wintergreens. The one at the bottom right, chickweed wintergreen, isn't technically a wintergreen at all. It's, a, it's actually more closely related to primroses and things, but um, it's not a chickweed either. <laughs> uh, so there's wintergreens and then uh, just a load of other interesting stuff. So bog asphodel, I just think particularly pretty. Uh, Walter lobelia uh, is a plant that grows with its leaves submerged, but sticks the flower head up out of the water. Uh, and then there's a whole stack of different orchids on that week. We usually see about a dozen species of orchid, including some quite scarce ones that are very localised. So lesser tway blade top left. That that has tiny, tiny flowers. They're about half a centimetre each flower, in fact, you know, just millimetres long. Small white orchids, very much a northern species, northern marsh orchid too. So, um, you know, plenty of flowers to look at. And these are, these are all alpine flowers. It was alpine flowers that first got me into botany. So... Um, I still have a real soft spot for them. And I, uh, if I have a couple of days up in the mountains looking at these sorts of things, they're, they're just, I just think they're gorgeous. And you get these delightful little cushions of these alpine flowers and none of them are really big and gaudy. They're all tiny and delicate and lovely. And I have a two or three days looking at those and I come down and look at a hedge and think, it's all very ugly. <laughs> uh, these, these are my favorites really. These are all species you would see in the Cairngorms. If you're down in Tayside, there's actually a, a whole stack of other species that we just don't see up there because of the nature of the soil. Uh, butterflies, um, you're probably aware that the further south you go, the more species of butterflies you get. Uh, but there are one or two um, species of butterfly that are very much northern in their distribution. And uh, northern brown argus, um, you kind of start getting into those when you get as far north as Lancashire. But the further north you go, the better marked they are. So the ones in Lancashire don't have that white spot on them. You've really got to start getting up in towards the highlands or certainly, well, I suppose, no, you, you could see them in lowland Scotland too. But the ones in the highlands all certainly have this white spot on top and the, the white spots underneath don't have dark centres to them. So they're, uh, other than that, rather similar to um, Brown Argus. The large heath I put in there is the Scottish form of it, which has no rings underneath. If you're seeing those down south, they've got a whole lot of little rings underneath. So it's a, I don't think it'll ever be split, but it's, it's certainly distinctive. And then Scotch Argus, the one on the left, that's a lovely looking butterfly, I think, and, and unbelievably common in the summer. Once you get into July, well into July, suddenly it becomes one of the commonest butterflies in the area. You'll just see them along the road verges and everything. They're really surprisingly common. And I pop these two in, um, not because they're in Speyside as such, uh, just to kind of complete the northern species of butterfly. Checkered skipper's much more over on the west side near Fort William area and mountain ringlets. That's much more common than in Tayside. Anywhere where you've got a more um, base rich soil, really, you're going to more chances of mountain ringlet. But they're both pretty scarce and very much northern at the moment. Um, some interesting northern dragonflies too, although white-faced data will occur in the south as well, but it's probably more common in sort of Speyside and um, some other parts up there um, than others. Northern damselfly is almost completely confined to Speyside. Highland data is really a subspecies of common data, they've decided now, but um, kind of distinctive. And if you sneak out of Speyside and visit Loch Brown and Glen Affric, which are not exactly very far away, um, there's a couple of other species as well. Northern Emerald is, is purely a, um, a highland species. Um, as you were hawkers as well, you won't see the, either of those in England. Um, Brilliant Emerald, I think, has like one or two sites in England, but um, that's it. Apart from that, they're all up in the highlands. And, and Downy Emerald is much more widespread, but you can actually see all three emeralds at some sites. Places like that place, top left, that's Loch Brown. Fabulous place. 
Uh, one more spot I want to sneak in in the Speyside part of the talk is this. This is um, this is the Findhorn Valley, um, and it's really famous. We used to call it Eagle Alley because it, it just gets so many golden eagles in it, and it's now beginning to produce a lot of white-tailed eagles as well. This is Golden Eagle. It's what the valley is the most famous for, but it's really good for raptors. I mean, you get all sorts there. And it's just great birding. You can you can get yourself up there and, and hang around and scan the skies for eagles. And whilst you're watching for those, uh, you'll see all sorts of other birds. This is raven. Um, well worth keeping an eye on them because they'll sometimes take you to an eagle. They don't like them and they'll go and chase them and stuff. So if you see a bunch of agitated ravens, it's worth keeping an eye on them. Uh, I didn't take that photograph in <laughs> the Findhorn Valley, I have to confess. That was taken in Yellowstone, but uh, they do the same there. <laughs> But all these uh, are certainly species that nest up there. Um, it's wheat here, top right, common sandpiper at the bottom right, the curlew, it's a common gull in the middle. You see loads of common gulls up there in the summer. Uh, top left is redwing, which we always think of as a winter visitor. But um, I've actually found nesting redwing up there, certainly singing redwing two or three times. And even on one occasion, I have to stop the car and shoo a baby redwing off the road so I wouldn't run it over. Uh, which is pretty unusual. There's some very rare nesting species in the UK, so finding nesting redwing is always a highlight. Other species up there, dipper on the river there. Dippers are on almost any fast-flowing river up in that region. Uh, but it's a good valley for ring oozles, and it's also, as I've mentioned, is really good for raptors. And if you're there in late summer, uh, it can be astonishing. I mean, we, we're now seeing large numbers of red kites in that valley. Um, I've seen up to four white-tailed eagles at a time, uh, three or four golden eagles at a time. You know, it can be just raptors everywhere, hen harrier, uh, merlin, peregrine, kestrel, sparrowhawk. I've seen goshawk up there. It's just a fabulous place. It's also very well known for its red deer, and there are huge numbers of them up there, probably too many to be honest, and they're eating everything. And you get these bachelor herds, um, and then in the autumn, of course, if you're up there in about October time, you get these amazing shows of the males when they're doing their maybe the, the rut and the males are bellowing at the top of their voice to um, show off to other males and prove that they're the best one to have this harem of females that they'll look after totally exhaust themselves by the end of the, that period but um, it, it is well worth being up there during that time I've only ever seen them clash antlers a couple of times but uh, you can certainly hear them bellowing from all around when you're up that valley I said I would come back to, to mountain hare. Um, I plopped it in here just because this is actually one of the best places I know to see them. There are one or two spots up that valley where if you know where to go and scan, um, you'd be very, very unlucky not to see a mountain hare. And that's the two variations in, I was going to say plumage for a second. I wouldn't mean plumage, but I like pelage, I think is the word. So they're white in the winter and this rather grey brown in the summer. And as you can see, noticeably shorter ears than brown hair. And it's actually a greyer colour than brown hair in the summer too. Almost in between a hare and a rabbit. <laughs> these are characters, you get lots of these. Uh, I, mean, I, I still have failed to work out exactly how long these guys have been up in the, in the highlands. But um, some people reckon over a thousand years that there have been these goats up on the hills there. Uh, they're certainly... They're not in huge numbers. I think they cull them now and again, but I like them. They're interesting looking things. Really, not not meant to be actually the same as the ones that have finally domesticated. But uh, anyway, well worth seeing too. So that's space side. A big chunk of the talk, as I said, was going to be that. Uh, however, I'm going to walk, move next up to the Moray Coast and the Black Isle uh, because particularly in sort of late autumn early spring and through the winter it's a particularly good area to visit to pick up a certain load of species that you obviously wouldn't get in land and then we'll head over for the last bit over to the west coast so we're heading to the the moray coast and this is a place called findhorn bay which you may have heard of and um i suppose if you're up in the area and you're there at the right time of year you really do want to get up there as well just to add to your list you're going to get a whole bunch of species that you wouldn't get in space side obviously because you're coastal here but um you can often arrive and look out to sea and think there's nothing there <laughs> it just looks blank you do need a scope you want to scan uh, and keep an eye out and sometimes you can get some really impressive numbers of sea ducks um they, these will hang around through the winter I'll be totally honest, the numbers have declined. Um, they seem to have moved around into Aberdeenshire a lot more now, so the big numbers seem to be off there. But certainly when I first started guiding 
20 odd years ago, uh, you could see thousands, uh, literally thousands of Scota off there. And if you searched through them, um, these are Idas at the frontier and Scotas at the back, all the little black ones of the Scotas. Uh, but you might, if you're, if you're sharp eyed, pick out that there's actually three different species of Scota there. So you look at, you've got all the Idas at the front, all the black and white ones, but if you actually go to the far left, the sort of bottom two of the Scotas, you can see a tiny bit of white, uh, I hope, on the wing, but also on the, can you see a white dot on the eye or not? These are velvet Scota, and then further up towards the top right, um, you can see a bird which has got some white and orange on its face, and that's a surf Scota. Uh, so this is them in more close up. Um, and I would say quite often in the area, it's hard to, hard to really say which is the more common. Um, common Scota is, but as the name suggests, usually the most common of any Scota in around the UK, but they do get good numbers of velvet Scotas up there. And sometimes you can find more velvets than common these days. They, it's the common that seem to have declined the most or moved around to inch in the most. So velvet Scota, you can pick out by sort of where the orange is on the bill. It's more at the tip and the lower edge rather than on top. Um, and they have this white flash on the eye and also a big white panel on the wings when they're in flight. Um, and I've actually found over the years quite a few of my own surf scoters. The, uh, uh, there's some years you've had up to four of them wintering in the area. So that's surf scoter at the bottom. It's a North American bird, so it's really rare in the UK. It doesn't nest in Europe at all. But um, sometimes you get a bird that gets blown across into the over to the UK and then it, it never goes back and it goes backward and forward and reappears every winter in the same place. So if you hear of one being around one winter, it's worth checking out the next year. To be honest, they're not turning up off the Moray Coast as much as they were. You've actually got better chances uh, around the Edinburgh area now, um, or Aberdeenshire. And other birds to look out for if you're on the coast there, that's long-tailed duck top right. And they are actually pretty abundant in the winter off there, and um, particularly around the Black Isle as well, on the Cromarty and so on. So absolutely, I think it's probably my favourite duck, really. I'm not a huge fan of ducks, but I really love that one. It's such an elegant thing. Uh, Ida top left, um, plenty of them along that coast, particularly when it's rockier. Uh, and if you really keep your eyes open and, and search everywhere, you might just find King Ida. So that's the rather colourful bird on the bottom right there. And at the moment, there's one at Nairn. It's been returning to Nairn for a few years. Uh, there used to be one off Berg Head for a few years. So it's again a bit like Surf Scota. Once one's found its way to the UK, it seems to keep coming back. So if you hear of one, it's it's well worth looking out for. They're stunning birds. And bottom left there is Red Neck Grebe. It's not a common bird up that area, but there's a few every year. So it's it's again well worth keeping your eyes open. Um, this is Berghead, totally different habitat we're talking about around Berghead compared to the Findhorn I was showing you earlier. Um, it's a much more rocky coastline. In summer, it's got lots of turns and stuff. Um, these are sandwich turns. It's got rock pipit. Um, and then things like turnstone. And in winter, it's worth keeping an eye on these little flocks of turnstones because sometimes you'll find um, purple sandpiper in amongst them. And um, anywhere along that coast where you've got rocks, you've got a chance of purple sandpiper. They're not common, but um, you certainly can find them. Um, nearby to there is a place called Lossy Mouth, and you've got a river flowing in, or well, the river Lossy fl fl uh, flows in to the sea there, and it has a little, I uh, barely call it an estuary, but it's got a slightly wider area that you can view. And it seems to attract a lot of gulls. They seem to come and they like to come and bathe in the fresh water. And it, I found both of these species there quite regularly. So again, we're talking winter. That's Glaucus gull on the left uh, and Iceland gull on the right, both in sort of immature plumages, which is actually the most common plumage you tend to see them in. So, uh, and they're, they're both what they call white wing gulls. If you see them as adults, they look a bit like a herring gull, but with white primaries. A few interesting plants up on the coast there. If you've got a Colbin forest, that's an area where you might find um, well, certainly three of those the one flowered wintergreen, coral root orchid, and, and creeping ladies' tresses, to be honest, is a lovely orchid. It occurs all through the whole area, right through Speyside and right up to the coast. It's reasonably common, actually. 
but it's a lovely little orchid and as soon as you start heading further south it just disappears you just struggle to find it and certainly very very rare in england um the bottom left one i'm struggling to find these days it used to be at berghead that's oyster plant but it seems to have gone from there and i haven't seen it for a while so i'm hoping it'll return it's a lovely plant very quite rare only in scotland and one site in england up in cumbria I couldn't leave the coast there without popping in here. This is a place called Channery Point, and it's become really famous for one reason. You kind of drive down to the end there where the lighthouse is, and it looks a bit bleak, and there's nearly always loads of people there, and you see them all standing around at the end looking a bit sort of cold and miserable. But what they're there for is these, and um, the as the tide's rising, if you're going to try and see them, you want to be there uh, on a rising tide when it's kind of racing in so um and then it's i don't know whether because it sticks out so far whether um fish get sort of just skirt around the very tip of the point but these beasts will come really close i mean they're absolutely fantastic and they will quite often when the water's really racing through get quite excitable and they'll start leaping out the water and stuff and i deliberately stood back so i could get a picture to show you just how close they are you know the, the, all these, you, you will be in amongst a crowd these days it used to be really quiet but as people have cottoned on to what what's happening there's more and more people going but it's well worth a visit and um to see the only time i've ever seen any dolphins as close as i've seen them off here has been on boat trips you know there's almost nowhere i can think of where you can see them this close from the land so great place well worth a, a pop in and then this is on the black isle on the north side of the black isle the cromarty firth uh, they actually um, decommission oil rigs there. So these oil rigs get dragged in and then left stood in the, the area there until they can be taken in for dismantling or repair. Uh, so it's an interesting place, but odd looking, you know, rather industrial looking in some ways. But it gets some, some fantastic um, birds. Uh, that's a long-tailed duck on the bottom right there. Uh, that Slavonian grebe at the top, but it's probably best known for its flocks of scorp. It seems to get more scorp than um, pretty much anywhere else I know now. The last time I was there, probably saw three or four hundred, so quite good numbers of scorp. They've they've really declined in recent years in other areas of Scotland, so it's a good spot from that point of view. And if you're on the, on that coast, you ought to pop in here. This is Udale Bay. This is the RSPV hide that looks out over the top end of this bay and it is a fantastic spot gets loads of birds uh, huge flocks of pink-footed geese and they're nearly always there or it's certainly certain times of day they'll come into roost there as well um it's one of the best wader spots in the highlands i know the highlands aren't particularly good for waders but they've got a few good spots this is a mixed flock of bartow godwin and not uh, it's one of the only places I've ever seen spotted red shank in the highlands that's top left it's golden plovers on the right sometimes big flocks of those uh, green shank bottom left um they're actually reasonably common there in the autumn but uh, disappear again in the winter red breasted meganza in the middle they're very very common there and bottom right there's uh, i'll pop that in that's um the bird in the middle is actually an american widgeon but uh what i should mention is that there's an enormous flock of widgeon spends the winter there it's from sometimes as many as four thousand to six thousand is the biggest count i've seen there and almost every year there's an american widgeon in there with them so the challenge is finding it you imagine it's going to stick out like a sore thumb but i'm afraid they're quite difficult nothing like as obvious as you think but i managed to find it twice i think so uh, it's also um noticeable that when you're at this spot you see quite a lot of these now what you're actually looking at there is not a hooded crow it's a hybrid um you've got basically everything north and west of that area is going to be hooded crows and anything south um, and east of there becomes um, carrion crow and where the two meet you do get a degree of hybridization so the bird on the right in the middle there you can see there's quite a lot of gray flecking on its belly and on its flanks and stuff um, so that one's probably more hooded crow than carrion crow the, the problem is when they hybridize the young are fertile which it's because of that they weren't split for a long time they were considered the same species but this whole difficult question of what is a species um you know it crops up here and the fact that the young are fertile means they can then 
breed with either a carrion crow or a hooded crow or another hybrid. So you can get absolutely everything from completely carrion crow, completely hooded crow and every grade in between in this area. So I would say neither of those birds is um, a pure anything. The one on the right is near a carrion crow and the one on the left is near a hooded crow, but the colours don't look right, the markings aren't in quite the right place and so on. <clears throat> so I'm very cleverly linking here to take you across to the west coast, where is where you have to go to see a proper hooded crow. And you can see how much paler the grey is on that bird. <clears throat> and this is typical of hooded crow. They do love being on the coast. I'm not suggesting for a minute you wouldn't see them in land. You would, but they, they really are most at home on the coast, I think. And so you tend to see bigger numbers when you actually get to the west coast. So we're right up on the west end. And to be honest, I'm sort of circled that area, but you could go a lot further south. You can go out on the islands and you'll still see a lot of the same species I'm going to mention there. And I'm going to finish right at the very, very, very top of that sort of ring that I've drawn there up at a place called Hander Island. And the west coast, I just love it. It's probably my favourite bit of Scotland in many ways because of the scenery. Just beautiful. God, that screams otter to me, that picture. <laughs> But there's a, a few birds that are kind of perhaps easier on the west coast than in Speyside or further east. Um, the bottom left is Winchat. Um, you can see those over a lot of Scotland, but they seem to be a bit better in the west. And um, there's a, other stone chats and wheat ears and other stuff as well. It's almost like, well, I'll pop that one in as a, as a, as a mention. Uh, at the bottom right, I popped in short eared owl. I could just as easily have popped in hen harrier or merlin or something. All of these are quite possible on the moorlands over on the west there. Um, above that is twite. And twite I very much think of as more of a western species. You, you do get them in Speyside but in really tiny numbers. And the further west you go the more chance you've got and you'll find lovely little flocks of twite on the west coast or on the islands. Uh, really nice but often mixed in with linnets. So actually linnets are increasing up there and twite are decreasing a little bit. So it's, uh, it's um, a bit of a shame. I'm hoping the linnets aren't going to just push them out. <clears throat> and the other bird top left there is rock dove. Now you might you might think that looks a little just like a pigeon that you might see in the middle of London or something but this is actually um, I'm assuming a lot of you probably know that this is the ancestor of all the feral pigeons that you see around. So all the pigeons you see in London, all your racing pigeons, all your white doves, all your fantail pigeons, everything that's where it first came from. And the only place you can actually see proper wild rock doves that look exactly like that with a white rump, two broad bars on the wing, silvery back and so on, I think looking really smart, is in the northwest of Scotland on the cliffs there. And it, I think it's great. You'll see a sort of a flock of 15 or 20 of these flying around together. And they're just the fact that they're all absolutely identical to me just makes them look a little bit smarter than your average pigeon when you like them. Good for turns up there, that's common turn on the left and arctic turn on the right. Um, other species that are perhaps more common up there. Um, the top one there, red-throated diver is all through the highlands really, but you really have to go further north and west to see, <clears throat> to more easily find a black-throated diver, which has to be, I think, one of the best British birds we have. That's a stunning looking bird, isn't it, on the top left. Below that is great northern diver. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, great northern diver don't breed in the UK, but we do get them through the winter and in the spring. If you're up in the northwest of Scotland in April, let's say, you will see them in that plumage. And in flocks, I've seen flocks of up to 26 great northern divers in some of the bays up on that northwest coast. So well worth a visit at that time of year to see those. They're just stunning birds. And um, on one occasion, I found a white bill while I was with somebody else who found a white bill diver. That's bottom right there. And um, they're being recorded more. I don't know whether it's just as more people are looking or what. It can be on either coast. I've also seen them at Burghead. But um, <clears throat> they're definitely increasing in the number of sightings. So you'd be very, very lucky, but you never know. You might just spot one of them too. One of the big key birds to look out for there now is white-tailed eagle, of course, and these were also wiped out many years ago. Um, as you can see there, made extinct in the early 1900s and then reintroduced in 1975 with over 100 birds um, released. And, and these were all released as young birds, so they were taken from nests in Scandinavia, 
and then brought over and released on the Scottish coast, largely on the Isle of Rum. And it takes them five years or more before they'll actually start breeding. So it's a bit of a long term project and it took a long time before you actually started to get any pairs nesting. But then the number of pairs has then rapidly increased. And we've now got over 130 pairs up in the northwest of Scotland. And um, you've really got really, really good chances of seeing one if you just go up there, and just put a bit of time into scanning. Um, I'd say even more so if you go out to some of the islands, particularly Mull is one of the best. Sky's got a lot too. But that whole northwest coast, you've got good chances. That's a more typical view. <laughs> That's my photograph of Whitetail Legal. Uh, actually, that is too. That, that was, uh, that's a nice view. There's a going overhead. But also, Golden Eagle are, are more common actually in the west than they are in the east. So, although there's certainly a good chance of, white, of Golden Eagle in a place like the Findorn Valley, you've got good, but even perhaps better chances over in the, the northwest if you keep scanning. Uh, it's always worth a boat trip. I often like to head out to one of the islands. You can either take a ferry or there's organised boat trips that you can do from places like Gerloch. Uh, and in the summer you get minke whales and they're just really well worth going out for. I'm amazed with that shot that I took that I didn't get any birds in that shot at all because very often where you've got minke whales you'll get big flocks of other birds, either orcs, kittiwakes, manx shearwaters, even storm petrels because where there's minke whale there's often a lot of food there there'll be um, you know tiny fish or little shrimps and prawns and krill and stuff so there'll be you know stuff for them to feed on and um, they're very often causing a, a disturbance and bringing stuff to the surface so um, you'll, you'll often see a lot of birds. Both kinds of seals are up there in good numbers. That's common seal and grey seal. Uh, and, but the mammal that most people are keen to see up there is otter. And although you've got otters actually everywhere in the highlands, um, the reason I popped it in here is because they're easier to see on the coast. And that's because they're more linked to the tide. If you tried to see an otter in Speyside, you'd struggle because most of them come out at night and they're really difficult to observe but if you're on the west coast where otters are reasonably plentiful uh, if you i personally think a rising tide a little bit like the dolphins uh, is best because i think as the tide comes in the fish start to come out to feed and that's when the otters find the feeding the best so um try and see them on a rising tide and if you're lucky you'll you'll find an otter that catches something a bit too big to handle while it's at sea and it'll actually come ashore and climb out on the rocks and uh, eat it there just great animals, just love watching them. So I said I'd finish up at Hander Island. Um, Hander is right up in the very far northwest and on a typical Speyside week we actually have one day in the summer, if, if it's spring when the birds are nesting there, we'll do a day where we drive all the way up. It's a long drive but it's through beautiful scenery and it's still probably my favourite day that we have. And we head up and then you, you land uh, Hander Island slopes so you land on one side on a nice shallow beach and then you've got a, uh, a walk across the island gradually gaining height until you get to these massive cliffs on the other side and then this they call the Great Stack which is a, a sort of slightly separate stack of rocks off the main cliffs and this is where the uh, Mark once said yeah probably the bulk of the seabird colony is and you've got all the classic seabirds on here uh, you'll notice there's grass on the top which is where these guys are um, they've made a huge effort in the last few years to get rid of rats on Hander Island and the puffins are actually um, moving back onto the main island as well so you can actually get nice close views now on there which is really quite a recent thing. <clears throat> but all the typical sort of seabird city birds are there so it's guillemots top left there going clockwise around you've got razor bill with the white lines on his face, shag at the bottom right that's very much a cliff uh, they like rocky coast rather than sandy coast, and that's Kitty Wake bottom left. Um, thousands, I mean, absolutely spectacular. It's really worth a visit. Fulmers are there in large numbers too. But the ones um, I, I love in particular, I, you know, I mean, you could see all those species if you went to somewhere like Benton, which would be much closer. But uh, up there, you've got a few species that you, you wouldn't see at Benton. So black guillemot, um, you've got very good chances of seeing those, even from the boat as you're heading across to the island gorgeous looking birds in the summer with that beautiful black plumage and the white in the wings and red feet and red inside the beak so really distinctive um and then a couple of other species the ones i i must now get very excited about is skewers 
uh, great skewer or bonksy um, they're increasing quite dramatically actually there and they're shoving out the arctic skewers a little bit um, if there's a problem with them it's that they're beginning to attack some of the birds off the sea cliffs now instead of just harrying them for food they're actually killing kitty wakes now and drowning them which is that because there's less fish than there were i don't know but it's certainly a bit of an issue um but this is probably my favorite i absolutely love arctic skewers and i i, I think i've always really really loved birds that fly well there's, to me the whole essence of birds is flight really and to actually see a bird that can be so agile and fast and just so elegant in flight i just uh, love it and that bottom picture there is he captures this scene if you're there in the spring when they're just arriving and setting up territories you'll see these birds racing after each other in the most spectacular fashion absolutely love it so that's a, a cracking bird to finish the main talk on there's a couple of other little pictures i've popped in just to mention that as well as the mainland highland you've got some fabulous wildlife watching to be done on some of the islands too uh, we do a lot of trips out to mull mull has got to be the best place in the whole uk to see eagles it's more like i can't remember how many pairs of white-tailed eagles that are on mull now it's more like 40 i think and lots of pairs of golden eagles it's really good for otters and all sorts um shetland and orkney are both really good <coughs> um sorry i'll come to those in a second this is uh, the outer hebrides sorry uh, in spring you get a wonderful passage of skewers past there that's a pomeroy skewer in the, in the picture there and corncrake at the bottom it's still without a without any shadow of it out the easiest place to see corncrake is uh, out on the uists so um that's another area we do lots of trips out there really popular and shetland and orkney also very very popular with a lot of our guests um the redneck foul rope are probably easiest on shetland there's some enormous seabird colonies there including some vast colonies of gannets and it's and i think shetland's also your best place to look for orcas you have to be very lucky um i've still not seen one there myself i've missed them by less than 15 minutes which is frustrating uh one day one day but the, the little flower at the bottom there is a uh, scottish primrose which is just a <clears throat> i think an absolutely delightful little thing tiny 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 flowers but uh, that's very common like well not you have to know where to go but even on Orkney there's the can be you know loads of them in certain sites so I hope you enjoyed that um I just want to say a big thank you to the people who've let me use their photographs you might have been looking at all those pictures and thinking wow what a wonderful photographer Roy is but uh, actually the majority of those were not mine some are from many of our guests who come on the trips but a few names there particularly um some of them you may have heard of and um thank you very much hope you enjoyed that